things that are made by man don't necessarily last, eternity will last, so the, the idea of being. Um, going down, you see, as of old, Samuel, spirit announces the presence, so there's some Christian iconography going on with the liter uh, literary. There's also some um, Egyptian mythology going on along there, too. Um, stone papyrus and um, lapis, so lapis is a very precious stone to Egyptians, those both come up. Um, and then the idea later of the tomb, so kind of calls to mind Egyptian tombs, um, where the pharaoh lived, but also the spirit of the pharaoh sometimes resided, so... Um, going down, Pythian pronounces, that's a, a, a Greek reference. Um, I liked the line to another slice wall where poor utensils, utensils show like rare objects in a museum. So in times of war, things that are left over after the war are considered, they're kind of giving their own sacredness just because they were able to survive. And really common objects like forks and spoons, you know, will end up in museums as part of the play of it, but also um, having to look at at life before the war as if it were in a museum because there's this disconnect there, there's this judgmental distance between between life as it was and life it is now. Um, Pompeii has nothing to teach us, we know crack of a volcanic fissure, slow flow of terrible lava. So this is a stark contrast to the you know very floral, effervescent natural imagery from Sea Garden. This is a volcano, it's very dark and dooming. Um, which makes sense in a war poem. Um, and then it starts out with a lot of biological imagery. Pressure on heart, lungs, the brain, about to burst its brittle case, what the skull can endure. So um, this idea, too, she draws through the rest of the poem is that there's the, your bones, your skeleton, the frame, can endure even though the rest of you can't. So things like skin and muscle and your face, they'll be melted off by um, lava. The lava, of course, being a metaphor for war, and our body being both a metaphor for, I mean, being a literal interpretation of our body, but also a metaphor for, like, society and being, you know, even though um, all of this is melted away, we still have our skeletons. Skeletons will survive thousands of years in tombs, um, you know, we can find them beneath the sand, um, so that's something that will last, we can count on that. But of course, the last lines are, we pass the flame, our skeletons have endured, we pass the flame, but we wonder what saved us, so, was it God, was it ourselves, was it, you know, um, society, what saved us, and what for, what reason, so that questioning sense of identity, you know, who am I, where can I place myself, where can we place ourselves in, you know, uh, post-war, post-apocalyptic situations. And where can I, the speaker, place myself now? So. I included a couple more sections um, after that poem, the ninth and tenth sections, because The Walls Do Not Fall is really just one extended poem. Um, it's like almost a hundred pages long. This first part is probably the most famous of any of her poems, um, this first section, but I, I wanted to provide the other two for context. And also you can kind of get more of like her sense of using Greek literature, Greek iconography, and everything. Um, but moving on from Helen in Egypt. So this is one of the last books that she wrote. Um, it was published actually posthumously in 1961, but um, uh, most scholars put it as being written between 1952 and 1955. Um, I, I was going off McKay, who wrote uh, The Cambridge Companion to HD, just to give me some sort of context on where the poems were written and, and what motivated a lot of them and how to interpret some of the, you know, even the references that I didn't get. Um, but yeah, so um, Helen in Egypt is based on a 20-line poem from Sakonodes. Uh, well, it was actually a much longer poem, but a 20-line fragment in which Helen, instead of hanging out in Troy during the Trojan War, is sent by Zeus to Egypt to kind of like sulk and think about what she did wrong for, um, you know, taking a lover that wasn't her husband. Um, H.D. took that as an opportunity to write an epic poem in the voice of a woman, as opposed to, you know, most epic poetry is voiced by men. Um, and so Helen in Egypt is 
Helen's epic poem in Egypt during the Trojan War. Now this is section five from book four. There are five books in total, and they're just, you know, really one big long poem. And she's in different places throughout. Um, I chose this particular poem because she is traveling across the River Nile with the helmsman, and the helmsman, yeah, <laughs> reference the helmsman of the first part. Again, kind of plays on the image of Chiron um, helping lost souls cross the River Styx from um, the world to the underworld. Um, that kind of imagery isn't as important because she's in Egypt at this point, but uh, it, it's just a, an idea that kind of popped in my head, so this is why I picked it. Um, you can notice looking at the, the poem to um, each of the stanzas are broken up into three line stanzas that roughly look like haikus and some of the um, some of the lines will line up with haiku formula so five seven five um, but it, it yeah it's not very strict interpretation of that it's just something to think about HD did uh, study a lot of Japanese liber literature and as one of the founding members of the imagist movement loved the, the fact that in Japanese literature everything is very image heavy and image focused all the words are very sparse so there's a distinct change from um, Sea Garden and the Walls Do Not Fall to this one because it's you know very parsed down language there's only one or two ideas that are expressed throughout the poem but all of these ideas are kind of layered with um, you know lots of meaning so um, I do not remember where or how I embark, so again, this questioning of sense of self, where am I? Um, but Helen literally did not know how she got there, because Zeus kind of like magicked her. But Helen, as a figure for the speaker of the poem, um, has no sense of self, of identity. Only the sound of the Rolox as the old man ferried me out, so is she on the river Styx? Has she died? There's a dreamlike quality to the poem. Um, strange ship called a caravel, and a caravel is just like a small Greek po boat, and she actually brings it up later, it's like, ah, it's a small Greek boat, but I thought it would be like really small, but it's not that small. And so this questioning of like physical space, of size, I was thinking it was, and, and the kind of idea of making something up, and um, things not meeting our expectations, our imagined expectations, so... I counted the flaming host of the familiar stars, the bear in Orion's belt, the dragon, the glittering chair. So the, since, since she's on a sea, there's not as much natural imagery to interact with, so she interacts with the stars, which are natural. Uh -huh. And the bear in Orion's belt, these are all constellations, the dragon, the glittering chair. So it's kind of like in Sea Garden when she's running through the brushes and she kind of gets the crown. Again, she's looking to nature and nature is giving her a sense of